the close of the 13th century, the shores of Japan were twice threatened by the forces of the great Mongol warrior Kublai Khan. Twice his great armadas reached the shore, and twice the wind god Icy sent hurricanes to wreck the fleet. Japan was spared, and grateful to the gods for their deliverance, the people called these storm winds heaven set. It is now 1944, and Japanese troops are in retreat. Their war of conquest is drawing to a close, their years of domination at an end. In the clouds above the Philippines, a lone pilot flies a desperate mission. Japan's march of conquest begins in 1931, when part of the Japanese-owned South Manchuria railway line is destroyed by a bomb. Japanese troops attack their Chinese counterparts, blaming them for the explosion. There is suspicion that the Japanese planted the bomb themselves to provide an excuse for their aggression. These hostilities mark the first step in a Japanese move to occupy all of Manchuria. Occupation is condemned by the League of Nations. Japan, in reply, declares her intentions to withdraw from the League, and the war in China escalates. In Japan, army insurgents embark on a campaign aimed at securing greater political power for the military. During this time, senior government officials are assassinated. The campaign culminates in 1936 with the formation of a cabinet dominated by military figures. A new order takes control in Japan. King is taken, Nanking sacked. The Imperial Army marches through Indochina. They drive the British from Shanghai and the Dutch from the East Indies. The rising sun flies over Eastern Asia. The Japanese co-prosperity sphere is taking shape. Then, against the advice of Admiral Yamamoto, Japanese planes bomb Pearl Harbor, drawing the United States into war. In the months that follow, their troops go on to capture the Philippines, Singapore and Burma. All that is behind them now. In October 1944, Imperial Japan faces its greatest threat since the ships of Kublai Khan. In the waters off the Philippines, a U.S. carrier group spends the day launching strikes against Japanese bases on Luzon and fending off hostile bombers. The ship's radar picks up a lone aircraft incoming. The alarm sounds and the gun crews take their stations yet again. The plane drops towards the carrier Franklin in a classic dive bombing maneuver. And at 1,000 feet, shows no sign of pulling up. To the crew aboard the Franklin, it is clear that this is no accident. The pilot of the aircraft, Rear Admiral Masafumi Arima, has crashed his plane intentionally. His attack is a graphic symbol of Japan's growing desperation. Arima is the first of the kamikazes. Throughout the war in the Pacific, Japanese planes have from time to time crashed into US warships. These, however, are planes which are damaged or on fire their pilots dying or perhaps already dead before impact. Wima's crash is a premeditated act of self-destruction, a gesture designed to prove a point to his superiors. 
and Arima is not alone in his way of thinking. Suicide is not alien to the Japanese. They honor suicide for its purity. To them, it bears no stigma. Generations of Japanese have been brought up on legends of heroic self-sacrifice by the samurai, Japan's ancient warrior class. Within the military, it is commonly accepted that every member of the force owes his life to his country and to his emperor. Aircraft carriers and their planes have been the final arbiter in almost every naval engagement in the Pacific. At the Battle of Midway, the Japanese Navy had lost its strength. Four of its carriers, including Akagi, the flagship which led the attack at Pearl Harbor, were sunk by American aircraft. From that point in the war, the US forces were advancing. More and more minds in the Imperial Army were looking to desperate measures as a way to win the war. The concept of suicide attack as a weapon is not beyond consideration. As early as the spring of 1943, officers of the Imperial Navy are drawing up plans for the use of human torpedoes. One lieutenant in favor of the scheme goes so far as to present fleet headquarters with a petition written in blood. About the same time, General Yashuda, a senior figure in the Army Air Force, is also advocating the use of suicide attacks against shipping. Yashuda is later responsible for the inclusion of ramming techniques as a secret component of pilot training. The first real indication of the storm to come is in the spring of 1944 during fighting on the Solomon Islands. Japanese troops find their anti-tank weapons are unable to penetrate the armor of US medium tanks. Control of the surrounding seas rests firmly with the Allied navies, and new anti-tank weapons and other forms of supplies are unavailable. General Yushiroko calls upon his troops to make the supreme sacrifice, offering themselves as human bullets. Incited to deeds of selfless heroism, soldiers strap satchels of explosives to their bodies and dive under the American tanks. The spectacle proves unnerving, but does little to stem the advance of the Allied forces. After a hail of criticism from Tokyo, Yushiroko is moved to a different post, but the use of human bullets continues. In the summer of 1944, the Japanese receive a double setback to their already flagging fortunes. On the 15th of June, US Marines land on Saipan, part of the Marianas chain of islands. The Marianas, with a resident Japanese population, have always been considered as part of Japan's inner ring of defense. On the same day, US B-29 bombers stationed in China attack targets on the Japanese mainland for the first time. Flying far beyond the range of anti-aircraft guns and Japanese fighters, the planes are untouchable. Their presence over sacred soil is a great shock to the high command, and there is worse to come. Shortly after the Marianas landings, a Japanese fleet of carriers and battleships engage U.S. naval forces in the Philippine Sea off Saipan. The incident is later referred to by the U.S. forces as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. The Japanese lose three carriers and over 400 aircraft, and with them, the last of Japan's best pilots. The battle for Saipan is as bloody a conflict as the US have yet encountered. 
defending troops and civilians alike see the island as part of Japan. The population have for years been told of horrors which will befall them if they are captured by US forces. Murder, rape and desecration are the best they can expect from their captors. These fears are reflected in the resistance offered by the islanders. After the losses in the Philippine Sea, another voice is raised in favor of sacrifice. Admiral Onishi, who for months has called for the reinforcement of Saipan, is acutely aware of the shortage of skilled pilots. Despite this, he believes that Japanese aircraft can still be a potent force. For Onishi, there are two sorts of airmen in the world, the winners and the losers. If a pilot facing a ship or plane exhausts all his resources, then he still has one left, the plane as a part of himself, a superb weapon. And what greater glory than to give his life for emperor and country? These words are lost in the corridors of Tokyo, and so Onishi makes a journey to the imperial palace to present an appeal to the emperor in person. He is turned away by the palace guards when the nature of his mission is revealed, and he returns to his duties. Onishi, chief of the Ministry of Munitions, Arms, Air Control Bureau, is engaged in a program to bring Japanese plane production up to a strength of 500 squadrons. He knows that any amount of plane production will not solve the problem. Japan simply does not have the skilled pilots to man them, nor will it have for some time to come. And for Japan, time is running out. Landing a plane aboard a carrier in any navy is a difficult, dangerous task. Before the war, Japanese pilots were expected to have a minimum of 400 flying hours before they could begin training for carrier operations. It was then another 400 hours on carriers before the pilot was considered competent. The pilots who flew over Pearl Harbor were the best in the world. But they are ghosts now. Since 1942, the Japanese have been forced to cut back their flight training program to the extent where they give practically no training in aerobatics or combat technique, and little in navigation or dead reckoning. A pilot with 200 hours flying time is considered to have graduated. Pilots of such reduced training are not only totally unsuitable for carrier use, they're also easy prey for their more experienced adversaries. After the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the problem of carrier pilots has solved itself in an ironic way. Most of Japan's great carrier fleet now rests on the ocean floor, and the Allied advances have pushed Japanese troops back to a line of islands which extends south from the mainland to the Philippines. For Japan, these islands will now become unsinkable carriers. As for those carriers remaining afloat, Onishi argues that as there is little hope of replacing their air crews, these and the rest of Japan's fleet have therefore become redundant. There are those in the Japanese Admiralty who are not convinced. They believe that with intensive training, these new young graduates can quickly adapt to carrier flying. Work begins immediately, and the pilots in this special training become known as black-edged cherry blossoms, a sorrowful term indicating that they will burst and fall before their time. In a matter of weeks, the scheme proves hopeless, the casualty rate amongst the trainees far outweighing the progress made. The future for the carriers looks bleak. The last days of conflict on Saipan are marked by fierce fighting and the return of human bullets. Many islanders commit suicide rather than face the torture and humiliation which Tokyo has promised will follow the American arrival. After the fall of Saipan, the high command orders that the use of human bullets is to cease. The Japanese are now faced with the greater threat of US bombers stationed on Saipan. The US fleet advances towards the Philippines in the next phase of their Pacific campaign. For weeks, Admiral Terioka, commander of the 1st Air Fleet in the Philippines, 
has been rejecting suggestions from a Rear Admiral Arima that a suicide strike by 24 aircraft against the advancing US fleet could change the whole course of the war. Arima, influenced by the rhetoric of Admiral Onishi, argues that these desperate times require desperate measures. It is mid-October and the Japanese have lost more than 5,000 pilots since the start of the year. Admiral Terioka opposes suggestions of special attack because he will not permit the slaughter of his men. He has told Arima that when he can show him how to bring the men back from special attack alive, then he will listen. Terioka is weary of war and can see no point in further suffering. As the Americans make ready their next great naval offensive, so too the Japanese prepare another decisive operation to bring the American advance to a halt. Operation Sho is a three-pronged naval attack against the US assault fleet. The Japanese will employ all available forces except their carriers. The carriers will be used as a sacrificial decoy to draw the US carrier force and her aircraft into conflict far away from the rest of the fleet. It is hoped that this will allow the Japanese surface ships to engage without being attacked from the air. The operation requires a leader of great conviction. Admiral Onishi, advocate of supreme sacrifice, is sent to the Philippines to replace the war-weary Terioka. He arrives only hours too late to witness Arima's own supreme sacrifice. Once in the Philippines, Onishi finds that he has scarcely more than 100 planes with which to launch his strike. Some of the US fleet carriers will each have aboard more than 100 combat aircraft and with them veteran pilots. On the 18th of October, US carrier-based planes attack Japanese-held airfields at Clark Field, Negros, Cebu and Mabalcat, causing extensive damage. In the evening, Onishi sends out a coded message signaling the start of Operation Sho. The next afternoon, Onishi is to meet with Captain Yamamoto of the 201st Air Group. When the captain doesn't arrive, Onishi travels to the 201st headquarters at Mabalcat Airfield. The 201st are considered to be one of the best Japanese units still in service and some of their pilots have previously used ramming techniques against American bombers. In the absence of their commander, Onishi outlines the vital role for aircraft in the show operation and the ideal methods of attack against the enemy carriers. Onishi's methods are dependent upon the pilots being highly skilled in combat. There are few, if any, pilots left in the entire Japanese forces skilled enough for this mission. And so Onishi offers the idea of suicide attack as the only realistic chance of success. Onishi cannot order a special attack. The men must make the decision for themselves. With Captain Yamamoto still absent from the base, Onishi presses his deputy, Commander Tamai, to put the proposal to the men. Tamai agrees on the condition that those who volunteer may form a new unit with their own name. Fighting over the previous months has taken a heavy toll on the 201st, and those surviving are in a state of constant tension. In present conditions, few of them expect to survive the war. The enemy is fast approaching. The danger to their homeland growing by the hour, the fate of Japan may rest with them. All of the pilots agree to be part of the special attack unit, and as arranged, the men are to choose a new name. An officer with the group suggests a title befitting men who will deliver their country from its aggressors. Shimpu, whose two characters in Chinese mean God and Wind. All present know this means the winds which sank the Mongol fleet, divine winds, known to them by a different name, Kamikaze. On October the 20th, the first US Marines go ashore on the island of Leyte. Onishi addresses the special attack unit or Tokatai as they will become known, 
announcing that operations will begin the next morning and assuring them that the Emperor will hear personally of their sacrifice. That same afternoon, some of the group fly to the airfield at Cebu, hoping to encourage other pilots to join with them. The men of Cebu choose to follow their comrades as Tokotai. While on the beaches of Leyte, the US Marines are as yet little disturbed by enemy aircraft. On October the 21st, the first of the Kamikaze take off for glory. Unable to find their targets, they return only to have their planes attacked on the ground by US fighters. There is, however, one spontaneous effort by a pilot not from the Tokatai. He crashes his plane into the cruiser Australia, inflicting heavy casualties. On the 22nd, more Japanese troops and equipment are dispatched for the defense of Leyte. At Imperial High Command, it is deemed that Sho will be the decisive battle to bring about the destruction of the US fleet. With three Japanese naval task forces steaming for the Philippines, the second air fleet sends a large detachment to Manila. Their task is to launch a massive strike against the US fleet the day before Japan's warships arrive. Onishi suggests that the second air fleet join with the Tokatai. Their commander rejects the suggestion out of hand. On the 24th of October, the massive wave attack takes place. Japanese planes, using conventional tactics, sink one carrier and three smaller ships. The cost is high, with more than 100 planes shot down. The approaching Japanese battle groups have no better luck. Attacks from submarines, aircraft and surface ships decimate the force. On the same evening, Admiral Nishimura, commanding one of the Japanese task forces, succeeds in sailing his ships right into the sights of a US battle group, allowing all the American guns to open broadside upon his startled fleet. By the end of the evening, the toll on combined Japanese forces is three battleships, six cruisers and seven destroyers. And all this before any of them reaches their objective. There is hardly a ship in the Japanese fleet which hasn't sustained some damage. After the failure of Sho, the first hint of success comes on the 25th when the kamikazes sink a carrier and damage several others. In comparison, attacks during the day by conventional methods inflict little damage and sustain heavy losses. News of the special attack is relayed to the Emperor. After his initial shock, he sends a message of congratulations to the unit. The Kamikazes have received the Imperial Seal of Approval. Onishi now uses the Emperor's words to bolster his recruiting drive for the Tokotai. During the following days, several sorties are flown by the kamikazes of the Philippines. From the outset, every unit is accompanied by observers sent to report on the glorious achievements of each attack. This system tends to cloud the accuracy of the claims, as the observers are reluctant to report that any of their comrades have made their sacrifice in vain. It is likely that the kamikazes, successful as they are, may only be achieving 10% of the damage claim. As the Leyte invasion rolls on, Admiral Onishi begins to refine the procedures and ceremony for the kamikazes. From the outset, the kamikaze unit is shrouded in ceremony and mysticism. The Hakimachi, a white headband which in samurai times indicated that the warrior was preparing to fight to the death, is introduced to the uniform. A pre-flight toast is also given for the pilots. In the early days, this is with sacred water. In later times, the water will be replaced by sake. With the continuing progress of the Allied forces, the future for both the Philippines and Japan is looking bleak. 
By the end of October, the only ray of light for the high command are the kamikazes. Traditionally, attacks against shipping were the sole preserve of the Navy air arm. Army pilots have never received training in this very different sort of combat. By early November, the Navy no longer has an air arm to speak of. The Army will now have to share the responsibility for attacks against shipping in defense of the homeland. In light of this, it is announced that a recent group of 1,000 Army flying graduates will immediately become kamikaze pilots. The kamikazes are now starting to take their toll on the morale as well as the ships of the U.S. Navy. The early attacks were treated as fluke or eccentric. Now it is clear that it is something much more organized. Radio Tokyo speaks of a new wonder weapon and the U.S. fleet continues to be attacked by a most frightening adversary. Aboard the American ships, men who want to live are fighting against an enemy determined to die. On the 5th of November, the first official army squadron of kamikazes leaves to attack the landing force at Leyte. En route to their target, they encounter U.S. bombers. All of the kamikazes ram the U.S. planes. An imperial edict is issued shortly after naming the Falling Stars as national heroes. From this point, kamikaze operations take a new direction. Attacks are switched from carriers to U.S. transport ships in a bid to stave off the invasion of Luzon. Heavy bombers are now to be used in kamikaze units, and efforts are also made to increase cooperation between the Imperial Army and Navy in place of their traditional rivalry. The U.S. naval anchorage at Ulithi is the target of the next phase of the Tokatai program. On the 20th of November, the Khitan or human torpedoes make their debut. Only one of the Khitan succeeds in hitting a target, an oil tanker filled with aviation fuel. The explosions are enormous, and the Japanese are led to believe that these wonder weapons are responsible for sinking at least three carriers. The truth is, the chitin are unstable and prone to going out of control, the majority of them killing their pilots before they reach their targets. In order to slow down the American progress, another large conventional attack is planned against the U.S. anchorage off Leyte. On the 25th of November, an important Japanese supply convoy en route to the Philippines and ships in Manila Harbor are destroyed by planes from two U.S. carrier groups stationed off Luzon. When news of the attack reaches Onishi, operations against the anchorage are suspended and a large kamikaze strike is ordered against the carriers. The kamikaze succeed in hitting four of their targets, inflicting the most serious damage yet sustained by the U.S. ships. Responsibility for air cover over the landing forces must pass to land-based planes as the carriers are withdrawn for repairs. As a counter to the threat of kamikazes, major changes are introduced to U.S. fleet operations. More new destroyers are made available for picket duty around the carrier fleets, while the carriers themselves double the number of fighters aboard to strengthen their combat air patrols. Morale also needs protection, and servicemen on shore leave are put on strict orders not to discuss the suicide attacks. 
As a prelude to their landings on the island of Mindoro, saturation raids are launched against the Japanese airfields on Luzon. These raids succeed in grounding all Japanese planes for several days. And as their control around the Philippines increases, the US forces are sinking 70% of all Japanese shipping in the area. On the 15th of December, the wind guard Icy strikes a blow for Japan. The US fleet is caught in a typhoon. Three destroyers are lost and many more are damaged, forcing the fleet to withdraw once again. On December the 30th, a massive fleet with 140 warships and their attendant support vessels sail from Ulithi to continue the task of neutralizing Japanese positions within range of Luzon. The kamikaze units of the Philippines have fewer planes than pilots. On the 4th of January, Japanese spotter planes report a fleet of 600 ships bound for Luzon. Two kamikazes make a sortie, and one of them succeeds in sinking the carrier Omani Bay. But the future for the Japanese on the Philippines is very clear. The kamikaze raids continue with more volunteers than aircraft for each mission. Onishi decides that all those without planes, himself included, will fight on as infantry when the Americans land. His plans are changed when he is ordered to Formosa before the invasion. On January the 9th, Mike 1, the invasion of Luzon begins. Resistance is stiff with a variety of suicide measures being used. On land, human bullets appear once again while the support ships are faced with attacks from suicide motorboats and the kamikazes. The US Navy crews have been trying different maneuvers to protect their ships, but bringing the maximum gunfire to bear on an incoming plane seems to be the only effective solution. The last organized kamikaze sortie of the Philippines campaign takes place on the 13th of January, a campaign which has cost the lives of 1,200 suicide pilots. As the fighting on the Philippines passes to the army, Onishi is busy in Formosa organizing new kamikaze units. The US fleet are not far behind, and they soon begin their duel with the kamikazes of Formosa. The Japanese expect that Okinawa will be the next U.S. objective, but the Americans are after a base which is within fighter range of mainland Japan, and Iwo Jima is their choice. At Imperial headquarters, with suicide attackers policy, they are still looking for the elusive destruction of the U.S. fleet, which will force an honorable peace settlement. The urgency of securing a settlement is brought home to the Japanese on March the 9th. US B-29s drop in sentries on Tokyo. The resulting fire claims nearly 100,000 lives. Operation TAN, an all-out attack by kamikazes against the US anchorage at Ulithi, is set in motion. Two days later, with Tokyo still burning, a flight of Japanese bombers depart on their final mission. Only half of them reach their target area. One plane hits a carrier at anchor, its bomb detonates, but the plane itself is so short of fuel that it fails to explode. The rest of the attackers are shot down or ditched through lack of fuel, and another decisive strike has come to nothing. Since January, both the Army and Navy have had plans for the defense of the homeland. Ketsu is the Army plan to hold Japan's pre-war territories in northern China, Manchuria and Korea, where they still have troops stationed. And the Navy plan, Tengo, is for an all-out kamikaze attack against the next American landings. Despite repeated failures to turn the tide of the war, 
the Imperial High Command maintains its belief that the samurai spirit will carry the Japanese warriors to victory. The rapid progress of the Americans had forced several revisions to the Japanese plans, and with the fall of Iwo Jima in mid-March, the Japanese options are reduced to just two. Surrender or Tokotai. From this point, all air offensives will be carried out by kamikaze units, and Tokotai will be the main instrument of defense. The need to combat continuing bombing raids over the Japanese mainland forces a huge changeover to the use of suicide squadrons. At the same time, the accelerated pilot training program reaches breaking point. Lack of time, fuel and planes means that the new pilots are barely capable of flying at all. On the 17th of March, the US ships are located 100 miles south of the Japanese mainland. Admiral Yugaki of the new 5th Air Fleet orders his planes, a mixture of kamikazes and bombers, into the air. The High Command, anxious to preserve aircraft for defense against B-29s, countermand his order. But the planes are gone. One conventional bomber succeeds in hitting a carrier, but all of the kamikazes are shot down without result. In all, 52 planes are lost. Two days later, conventional pilots, labeled Tsukepi, or lechers by their kamikaze colleagues, attack the US fleet again. The term lechers refers to their preference for earthly delights over those of the Yasukuni shrine, the spiritual resting place of Japan's dead heroes. The lechers in turn refer to the kamikazes in less cryptic terms as kichigai, madmen. A few of the Sukubi succeed in hitting two carriers, inflicting 1,000 casualties aboard the Franklin. The rest of them, including the kamikazes, have little effect, falling victim once again to the U.S. guns. In his diary, Admiral Yugaki blames these results on the failure by the leaders to prepare the troops, noting that thorough training is the secret of success, as it has been in the days of the great clan wars between the samurai. On March the 21st, Ship's radar locates a group of aircraft approaching the U.S. fleet. The combat air patrols are sent to investigate and find Japanese bombers carrying manned flying bombs. These Okas are the latest addition to the Tokotai program. All of the bombers are shot down. After the mid-March attacks, the damaged carriers are withdrawn for repairs under a heavy escort and the rest of the fleet move south. The absence of five carriers from the fleet leads the Japanese to believe that they have been sunk in the recent attacks and the US fleet is now in retreat. A great psychological victory has been achieved. Tengo, a massive suicide attack by the last of the Navy and the Air Force, will now be launched against the Americans when they invade Okinawa. After sailing south for several days, the US fleet breaks off and launches a bombardment on Okinawa. The attack signaling an imminent invasion. Tengo is ready to take effect.
While the U.S. forces prepare for their landings, the Japanese on Okinawa are busy concealing themselves in the hills and caves of the island. A few days before the Okinawa landings, American troops land on the islands of Karamareto to secure them as a fueling area for the next invasion. As on Saipan, they encounter fierce resistance. On the 1st of April 1945, the U.S. invasion force reaches the shores of Okinawa. The troops going ashore meet no resistance. The Japanese hold back, waiting to strike when the Americans relax. The hope is by doing this, their attack will also succeed in dealing a massive blow to U.S. morale. In the afternoon, the kamikazes arrive, and the attacks continue over the next days to soften the American reserve. On the 6th of April, the Japanese launch Ten Ishigo, Holy War, Part 1. In the radar rooms aboard the US ships, there is confusion at what they see. Traditional attacks by kamikazes have always come in small groups, hoping to evade detection by radar and the combat air patrols. But now, a new policy has been introduced. Huge waves of aircraft, with heavy escorts to draw off the fighters, move in to attack the US ships. On the 7th, the next phase of Tengo takes effect. While the kamikazes continue their attacks, the remaining Japanese fleet, including the world's largest battleship, Yamato, set sail as a surface special attack force. Their task is to destroy the US transports off the beaches of Okinawa. The Yamato is then to run aground and act as a coastal fortress with all non-essential crew joining the infantry in defense of the island. The Japanese ships carry aboard 6,000 men, none of them volunteers, and only enough fuel for a one-way voyage. Spotter planes find the special attack ships without any air cover, long before they reach Okinawa. Three strikes are launched from the US carriers, The special fleet is attacked and broken up, with Yamato, Yahagi, and four other ships sent to the bottom. With matters in Japan growing worse by the day, a new army headquarters is built in the mountain caves of northern Honshu. The Japanese army considers that every citizen is now a Toko Gunjin, special attack soldier. School children are indoctrinated and drilled for battle.
civilians and old folk learned to march in preparation for the defense of the homeland. The Japanese government, with its third prime minister since the start of the war, is in turmoil. The new prime minister has seen enough suffering and is in favor of peace. But there are those in the cabinet, including the war minister, and many in the army who are prepared to fight to the finish. At the time of the Yamato sinking, attacks by the kamikazes never cease. Fighting at Okinawa continues in brutal fashion by day and night. After dark, the threat increases. Ships off the island are subject to attack from Japanese swimmers who climb the anchor chains armed with knives or grenades. Around them, the kamikazes go to their death with or without hitting their targets. On the 19th of June, the Japanese commander on Okinawa orders all his troops to go out and die. Inspired by their colleague's sacrifice, many of them comply with acts of suicide or banzai charges. Towards the close of the Potsdam Conference, Allied leaders issue a joint statement calling upon Japan to surrender. There are still thousands of soldiers ready to defend the Japanese mainland, and the argument continues between those in favor of surrender and those wishing to fight. On the 6th of August 1945, a USB-29 Enola Gay drops an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The explosion and fire claims 80,000 lives. For those in favor of peace, there is no greater argument for surrender. And for those in favor of war, it firms their resolve to fight on. On August the 8th, Russia declares war on Japan and launches an immediate offensive in Manchuria. The Japanese are overwhelmed by the speed and numbers of the advancing Russian forces. On the 9th, the Supreme War Council are in audience with the Emperor discussing the Russian attack in the Potsdam Declaration when a second bomb is dropped on Nagasaki. The US calls on Japan once again to surrender or be faced with total destruction. The threat of destruction is backed up by the permanent presence of ships and aircraft off the Japanese coast. No decisive strike, no amount of sacrifice, no heaven-sent winds will reverse the fortunes now. On the 14th of August, it is announced that the Emperor will make a public broadcast at noon the next day. Some at the War Ministry, anticipating an announcement of surrender, attempt to coup in a bid to prevent the Emperor from making his broadcast, but their efforts are foiled by the palace guards. On the morning of the 15th, 
US planes launch another attack against targets on the Japanese mainland. Admiral Yugaki announces that he will take part in the day's kamikaze sortie against the US ships. Yugaki rejects appeals from his fellow officers to remain behind, insisting that he may choose the hour and manner of his own death. At noon, the Emperor announces the Japanese surrender, and Admiral Yugaki takes off to lead the last of the kamikazes to glory. A few hours later, Yugaki sends his final radio message. I alone am to blame for our failure to defend the homeland and destroy the arrogant enemy. The valiant efforts of all officers and men of my command during the past six months have been greatly appreciated. I am going to make an attack at Okinawa where my men have fallen like cherry blossoms. There I will crash into and destroy the conceited enemy in the true spirit of Bushido, with firm conviction and faith in the eternity of Imperial Japan. I trust that the members of all units under my command will understand my motives, will overcome all hardships of the future, and will strive for the reconstruction of our great homeland that it may survive forever. His message ends, Tenno Haika, Banzai. In the evening, as Admiral Yugaki's spirit wings its way to the Yasukuni Shrine, Admiral Onishi, mastermind of the kamikazes who sought to defend the shores of Japan through sacrifice, joins with his ancestors, honor intact, exiting the world by his own hand.